Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Sam yes. is there too. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, just to let you know, we are live right now. So okay. uh, we can uh, start off. Fantastic. Great. Would you like me to share the presentation? Yeah, let's go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this talk. Uh, Sam and I are so excited to share this talk with you on scaling innovations in very large organizations. Um, I'm also super happy to co-present this with my friend and colleague, Sam Yen. Sam and I both worked at SAP, uh, where Sam was the chief design officer, and I led the Design and Co-Innovation Center in Palo Alto. Now, we both work at JP Morgan Chase. And we can all agree that both these companies qualify as very large organizations. We will draw on our insights from our many years of lived experience driving innovations. And in this talk, we will share practical advice for anyone out there who's trying to do the same. I'll now invite Sam Yen to introduce himself. Great. Well, thank you, Jonaki, and thank you, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. This is such a wonderful idea to, to spread this across the world. Um, uh, greetings from uh, California. I'm in uh, Lake Tahoe. And, um, and uh, yeah, just wanted to get start, started by uh, talking about this important topic. Um, and Jonaki, just for you to know, I, I can't see the slides, so I'm kind of going blind here. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but yeah, if, if we go, um, uh, I wanted to start with a story. Um, and if we you know, go to the first um, slide, hopefully um, everybody could see um, and recognizes th this character, Luke Skywalker. Um, and we're going to tell. A... I'm can sorry. You guys, can you see the slide? No, I'm not seeing the slide. Interesting. Okay, I will share. Interesting. There we go. Yeah, we can see that now. You can see it now. Okay. Yeah. yeah perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Well, yeah, John Ike introduced me. Uh, I worked with her at SAP, now, now at JP Morgan. Uh, but, but let's start the presentation by going to the next slide, John Ike, if you don't mind. I uh, just wanted to hopefully recap a story that the audience is um, hopefully uh, familiar with. Um, and uh, this is Luke Skywalker. This is the very first Star Wars movie. And uh, in, the, in the very, very quickest synopsis of Star Wars um, that you'll ever hear, our hero, Luke Skywalker, really discovers some magical powers that he has and uses them in the ultimate fight between good and evil. And by the end of the movie, he's able to over overcome the forces of evil um, and actually save an entire planet from destruction, right? Like I said, the shortest synopsis of Star Wars that you'll ever hear. But what happens in the next movie, for those of you that are familiar with this, The Empire Strikes Back. Please go to the next slide, right? If you, if you recall this movie, um, again, a short synopsis, the powers of evil are able to regroup. And by the end of the movie, um, everything that our hero, Luke Skywalker, struggled to achieve in the first movie has completely been undone. And if you've actually seen the movie, remember at the, the final scene, our hero is literally hanging um, from, a, from a satellite and the, the balance of good and evil in the universe you know, really lies in a balance. And it doesn't look good for our hero. But if we go to the next slide, this was a Hollywood movie. So together with a group of friends, the forces of good were able to overcome the forces of evil and restore you know, the balance to the universe and good overcame evil. Okay, why do I tell this story? Um, because in, the, in this particular talk, we're talking about organizations uh, and, their, uh, and, their, and their need to innovate. And what's happening to a lot of organizations around the world right now is, especially if you're large and established, you had your chapter one, where the start, where the where the founders of the company were able to take the company and make it really, really successful. But often, especially in recent years, something has happened um, and is disrupting industries, all kinds of different industries. And many companies are struggling to figure out how they will overcome their disruption to be able to survive and thrive going forward. 
this is very much like at the end of the second movie. The, you know, there's been a disruption and the balance, uh, everything is really in the balance. And what organizations really need to do is figure out how to write their third chapter, how they will be able to overcome that disruption and become successful again, right? And oftentimes, because of the uh, because of the disruption within their 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 industry, innovation is this buzzword uh, that a lot of organizations are looking towards to be able to innovate, to be able to overcome their disruptions. So we talk a lot about innovation, but one of the things uh, that I want to talk to you about is an actual definition of how we could talk about innovation. Right? A lot of people talk about it, but what does it actually mean? I like this equation that I've heard some people talk about innovation. And it basically says that innovation is actually um, an equation. It's a function of two different things that need to come together. The first part is creativity. Now, creativity is really the big ideas, right? Um, in order to innovate, you need to have big ideas. You have to have new ideas. Um, the ideas that you were working on as an organization before um, have to be innovated on. You have to have you know, new big ideas in order to have that innovation. But what a lot of organizations also recognize or maybe fail to recognize is it's not enough just to have big ideas and new ideas. You also have to be able to take those new ideas um, and take those out to market so that your customers and your clients are able to actually experience those things. That's true market innovation. So in addition to creativity, you also need execution, right? So this equation, innovation is equal to creativity times execution. It's a function of both. Um, it's not one versus the other. You need both. You need big ideas. You need to be able to take those out to market. And together, that's what we mean by market innovation. And this is what a lot of organizations need today. But if you look at what an organization is good at or typically good at, most organizations are very, very good at execution. Um, and one way that we could think about execution is the ability for an organization to be able to solve problems. It's about problem solving, right? If you think about it, most organizations are pretty good at this. You've got people that are measured on how well you could take an existing problem and find a solution and execute on that. We have MBOs, we have um, processes, and those have been optimized over time to really fine tune the execution capability of an organization. Now, truth be told, most organizations are good at this, but if you're only good at execution, that's only leading to incremental types of innovations, right? The ability to make things a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. I'm not saying that that's bad, but especially in times where breakthrough innovations are required and they're required very, very quickly because you're disrupted, just being good at problem solving alone isn't going to cut it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the other side of that equation, creativity, right? If you look at yourselves or if you look at the leaders of your organization, how many people feel that the leaders of their organization are creative people or, or view themselves as, as creative, right? And then even if they, they do, how many people feel that the leaders of their organization have the, have the capability to take that creativity that might be individual and spread that across their entire organization, right? That might be 10 people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, or even tens of thousands of people, right? Typically, most leaders don't have that. Um, because they didn't really learn it in school. Um, but the question is, how can you have innovation, which is so needed right now, and, and have that execution, but really lack the ability to take creativity and scale creativity across the organization? Now, we talked about execution as being like problem solving. How good are you at solving problems? One way to look at creativity is the flip side of that. Instead of problem solving, another way you can look at creativity is problem finding. You know. Are you solving the right problem that makes a difference today, right? Because that problem might have changed. What got your organization successful was solving problems that were defined for yesterday's crowd. Um, but today, a disruption has happened, whether or not you know, the, the user needs have changed or the market conditions have changed or technology innovations are now in play. The boundary conditions have shifted and the problem you were solving yesterday might not be the right problem anymore. So creativity, you could think of as the ability to identify the problem that's worth solving. And that's often what's, what leads to breakthrough types of innovation. Again, it's difficult for a lot of organizations because you, you go to school and you're given a problem and you learn how to solve that problem. Unless you go to a design school 
um, not, uh, not often are you, are, you, are you given the tools to find the right problem to solve in the first place. And that's really the connection of this talk as well, right? Creativity is the missing piece in organizations and there is a connection to design uh, because of the practices of design. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over back over to my colleague, Janaki, to talk about design thinking and, and the way that organizations can adopt design thinking to help in their innovation journey. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm Janaki Kumar. I'm the head of design for Commercial Bank at JP Morgan Chase. I'm also a co-instructor at uh, Stanford, where I teach a course called the um, Customer Experience Design from a Neuroscience Perspective. As Sam mentioned, many organizations are streamlined for executions and problem solving. But what if the problem we are solving is not the right one to begin with? And this is where to address this issue, we use design thinking methodology as a structured process uh, for innovation. As we mentioned earlier, prior to JP Morgan, Sam and I worked at SAP. I led the Design and Co-Innovation Center, which is a design agency within SAP and worked with SAP's customers on their strategic innovation projects. We worked on over 500 projects over five years uh, and uh, with, with some of the largest customers on their most strategic and innovative projects. And we applied the design-led approach to a variety of industries and domains in marketing, in consumer products, in aerospace, in sports, public sector, et cetera. And across all these projects, we noticed some interesting trends. Initially, our projects were focused on improving usability and desirability, but over time, the nature of projects started to change. Our customers wanted to transform their organizations using the power of design-led innovation. As Sam mentioned earlier, the organizations realized that they were over-indexed on execution and needed to bolster their creativity in order to be uh, innovative. We worked on several of such transformation projects. We also conducted a survey with thousands of responses. Now, based on this qualitative and quantitative input, we observed some interesting patterns and distinct stages in an organization's innovation journey. The four stages in an innovation journey are interested, invested, engaged, and scaled. We will now explain and share details of each stage and Sam will share personal anecdotes and stories to make each of these stages come to life. And I will share the key barriers and offer actionable recommendations to overcome them. Yeah, with that, Sam. Right, thank you, Janaki. So this is how it starts often at a lot of organizations, right? A key executive becomes interested in the opportunities of design and design thinking to be able to bring innovation mindsets and cultures into their organization, right? This might happen at the very top. At SAP, this was the founder and chairman of the company uh, who learned about design thinking through the Stanford Design School, the D School. So uh, oftentimes, we, we also call this the lonely soldier effect, right? Because oftentimes the executive will say, you know, for example, you, Jonaki, um, this is, I, I just learned about this great thing. It's called design thinking. And I'd like you to help bring this across my entire organization, right? In the case, case of SAP, there's tens of thousands of employees, right? So you feel very much like a lonely soldier on this journey. Um, and, you know, what I think, you know, I, I also wanted to share uh, maybe some of the common pitfalls um, that organizations we see over and over doing this, right? So the, 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 the reaction sometimes to this is, oh, you know, I want you to train as many people as quickly as possible on, on this, this methodology. And you, you start to arrange all kinds of trainings and you train thousands and thousands of people. And you would think, you know, what's wrong with that? You're getting everybody excited. And that's true. Everybody that goes through these workshops and these sessions get very excited about the opportunities. But when they return to work, we've seen that they get even more frustrated sometimes because the environment hasn't changed. Uh, the processes, um, and, the, um, and the rules and the way you do things haven't changed. So they're unable to practice what they learned in these workshops. Um, so that's just one of the common um, 
um, things to avoid when you're in the stage. Okay. Exactly. So the key barrier in the stage is that even though you have the senior executive support for innovation, there is a lot of middle management resistance. So that's why it feels like you're a lonely soldier at the stage. Our strategic recommendation is not to try to train the entire organization, but rather to focus your effort on a pilot project and try to get some quick wins and show rather than tell about innovation. Thanks, Janaki. And that brings us into the next phase, right? Now you're getting your quick wins and, and maybe you're even building on top of your quick wins to, to get more and more impact in the organization. And the executive sponsors are saying, okay, this is great. Um, I want to invest more. I want to build out the team. I want you to have more impact in the organization. Um, this feels like though, sometimes you're having success in silos. What does that mean? That means that in the projects that your team, your transformation team, your innovation team is directly working with the, the different lines of business on projects, those are going well, but you're very much leading and driving those projects. Um, and uh, other parts of the organization that try to do something similar um, aren't having as much success. So it's only success you know, when there's a lot of effort on your organization to really get involved. And that's why we call that success in silos. Um, one of the, uh, you know, again, I'm gonna give examples of some things to avoid. You gotta be really careful here um, not to be seen as an ivory tower group. What, what do I mean by that? That means that, you know, you're getting sponsored by an executive, you're getting a lot of attention, you're getting a lot of funding and maybe a lot of special treatment um, to be able to get those results. And sometimes you just have to make sure that you're bringing the rest of the organization along with you for the ride. Jonathan? Exactly. And so the key barrier at this stage is the tribal nature of teams, especially if the innovation team is getting some credit for their success in forging new ways of working, while the rest of the organization is, is stuck in, and required to follow old processes. So our recommendation at this stage is to truly address the tribal nature and empower other teams to innovate as well. And this it will combat the fear of missing out or the FOMO effect. Yeah, and that brings us right into the next stage, which is you know if you're doing that well and you're also engaging the organization, the organization does, as the definition says, become engaged. And, and this is really, um, I, I see um, as the, the critical inflection point for really starting to get adoption across your entire organization. And you know, what we also call this phase is a shift from push to pull. What that means is instead of executives pushing this mandate across the organization for, for different projects, there are teams that are seeing the success that, these, that you're having in the success for silos phase. And they're saying, hey, I want some of that for my organization as well. And they're proactively reaching out and pulling you into their organization and saying, teach us, help us, be able to adopt these processes, help us bring in the right skills, uh, help us you know, learn the right techniques so that we could be successful doing this ourselves, right? That's why we call it from push to pull. There's a really funny story actually um, in, our, in our current organization um, because sometimes the pull comes from a part of the organization that you would never expect. Uh, in our case, this is the legal organization that you know, reached out to us and said, hey, design thinking, creativity, innovation, we need more of that you know, within our legal group as well. And this isn't you know, necessarily for the legal team to be creative in terms of how they interpret laws. That's not the right um, message here. But they saw you know, um, a fundamental tenet of this experience is really understanding who the clients are and creating a better experience for, for the client's service design, if you will. Um, and certainly our internal legal teams um, have legal services that they provide to our internal clients. Jonica? Exactly, so be careful what you wish for. So this stage, uh, the key barrier is that the demand for design, uh, design support far exceeds the supply. And this can be a very stressful time for a short staffed design team. But it's also a good sign because that means that the organization is now moving past stage two in their innovation journey. So our recommendation here is to document the best practices and offer trainings to leverage the passion in the non-designers in the organization to truly help you scale. Yeah, and, and that, that key word is scale. Um, and that's the, the final phase of this is how do you 
you know, you're, if, if you're doing this well, and it happens over time, it's not happen overnight, but if you're doing this well and you're helping organization be successful, the more success you have, the more you're asked to be able to help other parts of the organization. And at some point, you know, you only have certain numbers of hours in the day, days in the week to be able to help the organization. So you have to start shifting your mindset in, in terms of, okay, how do I now scale what we're doing so that it has more impact across the entire organization? This is thinking about processes and technologies and people and training and education and setting up centers of excellence. This is the type of mindset you need to get into to be able to have the impact across your entire organization. But the key barrier here is complacency. And uh, just because you're putting in the process, we, we don't want to adopt an innovation by checkbox mindset since design-led innovation is now part of the standard process. So the strategic recommenda uh, recommendation here is to continue to reinforce learning, celebrate your success, avoid falling back into old ways. So remember that innovation is a journey and not a destination. And that's a great time to kind of bring back the entire journey, right? Hopefully everything that we said makes sense, right? Seems like it makes sense, seems like it's almost common sense, um, but it is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. In our case uh, at SAP, this was a 10 year journey. And, and I, you know, I, I think we could do it faster now, uh, now that we've kind of learned what works and what doesn't work. And hopefully that's what we're trying to share with this presentation, just some, just some best practices, you know, what, what works and what hasn't worked in each of these different phases, right? Um, um, when you graduate from each of these different phases, remember, this was not only our own journey, but we worked with hundreds of customers and we also got thousands of survey results. Um, so, so we did find that this is a pretty good way to represent what that innovation journey looks like for different organizations. And then for each of these particular phases, there's lots of things to avoid, common mistakes that organizations make over and over again. And then also things that are success patterns, things that help prep the organization to be able to take the step into the next phase of their innovation journey. Um, so if you're able to do this, and if your organization actually has the stamina and the will to you know, go through this entire journey, the results um, are, are real, right? Um, you can achieve that innovation going all the way back to the beginning, right? You know, the, you know, the, the, the trilogy of Star Wars that I said, you know, again, most organizations are at that Empire State Strikes Back stage where they're being disrupted and they really need to figure out very, very quickly what they need to do to write their third chapter and be able to be successful. And innovation is that key part of that equation. If you're able to go through that entire journey, um, the results um, are real and they are very material. Exactly, yes, the results are indeed real. So everyone asks, what is the ROI for all this effort and in investment in design-led innovation? So to answer this question, the Design Management Institute created uh, something called the Design Value Index. And their research showed that design-centric organizations out outperformed their peers by 211%. So to conclude, right, it's more pressing than ever for large organizations to stay innovative or get innovative. So don't wait, innovate. <laughs> Remember Sam's elegant equation. Innovation equals creativity times um, execution. And most organizations are over-indexed on execution and uh, need creativity and this design to transform. However, this transformation does not happen overnight. Innovation is a journey, not a destination. And in our experience, there are four distinct stages to an innovation journey. Interested, invested, engaged, and scaled. And learning how to navigate through these stages is the key to success. Thank you so much. And we can take some questions now. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing so people can see us. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, uh, Janaki and uh, Sam. It was uh, quite interesting. And uh, I think we have a few questions from uh, the uh, attendees, but I think a lot of it you've already covered when you're speaking about uh, how to change focus when you're already uh, focused on solving a problem and over time you realize that there needs to be a change in direction. So uh, let's just pick out the last one. What strategies have you used to cultivate the design mindset in non-designer employees? 
Yeah, I mean, I think first, you know, uh, when we say non-designers, let's be more clear, right? It's the product management team as well as the development team. So if you think about the, the Venn diagram um, of, um, of the different skill sets that you need. So <clears throat> with product management, you know, they are uh, looking at the business viability, <clears throat> excuse me. So talking to them and making sure that uh, we can uh, work on that collaboratively together. And then when you work with the, the development counterparts or the, uh, the other parts, making sure that you're talking about feasibility, right? So this is how you try to, um, and then you inform them um, the, with the human aspect of desirability, usability, and um, really bring that empathy and advocate for the user. And that's your role. So, you know, you have to be situational in how you engage with the counterparts in the organization. Um, but when you, when you explain to them in the way and provide the information that's, that's meaningful to them, um, that is the best way to cultivate this design mindset. Mm. Yeah, and Sam, if you can add. Yeah, I, I might add to that. Um, I think language is very important, especially if you're talking to a group of non-designers, right? So don't be too religious about using the design buzzwords that we like to use and that we've been taught and we talk amongst ourselves in, right? Um, use language that just makes sense and is common sense to you know, your business counterparts, right? So um, nobody would say that you know, understanding um, your end client or your end customer is really, really important in terms of setting the direction for everything that you do from a company perspective, right? So instead of you know, calling it uh, user-centered design and, and things like that, just saying understanding your customer, right? Instead of using terms like fail fast, fail you know, quickly, um, especially in you know, uh, where we work at a bank, which is very risk averse, you'd say, wouldn't it be good to just do a little testing and learn quickly from that, right? It's the exact same thing, but you're communicating that in a language that people kind of understand, as opposed to trying to teach them a new vocabulary that's you know, really kind of only kind of learned in the design community. Oh, that's perfect, yeah. And, and one other trick that we use often is to let your customers speak on your behalf. So then you don't have to talk about design in, for the sake of design, but you can talk about customer success and let them speak on your, on your behalf. Yeah, language is so important and yeah getting the customers on your side. <laughs> that exactly what was on my mind when you said uh, we as designers and as uh, end users would be calling user as a different thing. And what we define is the goal for them and who is this user differs. And getting on the same page with the language is I think uh, the most important thing. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for joining us and uh, for giving us amazing insights about scaling innovation. And uh, thanks a lot for being a part of the World Design World Press Designer Conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure hearing from you. All, All the best, right. guys. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone, now we have another talk uh, coming up where the team from the World Class Designers are going to talk about how we put this together. Uh, so please join us in the next uh, session. <laughs>